There's the crazy guy running around, and I don't think a lot of you knew that I'm on, on the blue team for a public school. Um, I got some flack about my subject line being a little bit long. The original title talk was Dave Relic, the formative years. You know, well, why in the hell is the FBI banging on my door at 6 o'clock in the morning? True story. So I've got some information for you. I've got some ideas for you. I'm going to show you how I do things. And yes, there are embarrassing pictures of Dave. Don't get too excited. That is not the baby picture you're looking for. I live uh, by a creed, don't do anything to somebody that you aren't willing to do to yourself. So that's my baby picture. My email address is down there if you want to contact me afterwards and flame me privately. Uh, if you want to do it publicly, there's my Twitter handle. Um, either way you want to do it is good by me. IT for me was a career change about 15 years ago. It started out in my basement. It was my basement at least, not my mom's. Dave and I ran a Linux MUD online off of our DSL. Somewhere in the room is Rocky, who was my ISP at the time. I don't think he knew he had that, but we did it. And it just grew from there. And you know, I got caught into the Y2K craze. There was a lot of money flying around, a lot of people hiring and everything. I just used it as my chance to jump. Worked at a small business for a while. And then in early 2000s, um, I flipped over to the public school districts. I want to give you a little overview of what the public school district is like, what kind of things we face, show you how it's the same to the corporate world, and, and also places where it's different. My environment is actually pretty interesting. I've got 12 buildings in a metropolitan area. It's a fairly large city. Um, 7,000 users I've got. 6,300 of them are kids. And I'll hammer this point home throughout the whole presentation. Those 63,000 children, or 6,300 children, are my sole purpose for existing. They are our business purpose. They're not the enemy, you know, even when they're hacking, they're not the enemy. 700 staff, we're primarily a Microsoft and Cisco house. Um, and we'll get into why we do it that way in a little bit. 35 servers, your typical combination. A uh, little bit of XP left, but there, that is going away. We're on track to have that gone by April. And yes, we've embraced BYOD. And we'll get into that in a little bit of detail later. Seven people in the IT department counting the secretary against the 7,000 of them. Um, you look at any of the studies on school districts and, and how many people and staff you're supposed to have, we're dramatically understaffed by any measure. That's life. Our secretary is awesome. She runs our Cisco IP phone system inside and out and as a secretary. Just an amazing group of people. Three desktop technicians, they each take a group of schools and they handle the day-to-day -day tasks at the schools. I've got a network administrator. Um, handling low-level um, server stuff and all the Cisco stuff, and then I'm the senior engineer. And yeah, I know money's tight for everybody in an IT department. For us, it's really tight. We're a shrinking school district. Our budget goes down each year, not up, because our enrollment goes down. And, and part of the funding we get is based upon our enrollment. At the same time, every dollar I spend on security, even though we all know it's needed, and, and I have the backing of management that it's needed, it's a dollar that isn't spent in the classroom, and that's where the money needs to be. I've got all the departments you guys have got. I've got HR, I've got finance, I've got PR, I've got all that stuff, plus all kinds of academic stuff, pupil services, I don't even know what they do. Um, I, I do. Academic services, that's who makes the curriculum. We've got, you know, we feed 7,000 people every day at lunchtime. Every day. Building management. We've got a huge building staff, 14 buildings to take care of. Departments get all their money on August 1st. That's when the state rolls our money. That's when the rollover is on the property taxes. So all the departments are flush on August 1st, and they're ready to go. You know, they want their new software. They want their new computers. School starts on August 24th. They want it before August 24th. From August 1st to the end of October 30th, it's just total chaos. And credit to my boss for letting me come here to that. He'll be watching later. I hope he sees that part. Teachers are an interesting dynamic. Contrary to public, uh, you know, the public's perception of teachers, they are incredibly smart people. And they are incredibly dedicated to the children. They work very hard. You know, and, you, and you see how much they make. And oh, they get the whole summer off. And they get Christmas break. I promise you, in the summers, they're going to classes. They're getting their PhDs. They're going to seminars. They're learning new stuff. And they're coming back with boxfuls of software that they have to have by August 24th. And they come in three days before school starts. <clears throat> I 
I'm, you know, it, it's off the wall stuff. It's just amazing. The students, though, like I said, first and foremost, they're why we exist. I serve their needs above everybody else's. If they need to get to a website and my filter's blocking it, I take care of that before I take care of the superintendent's email problem. It's just the way we operate. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it's interesting. They're children, like we all were, so they're learning. They're learning academics, they're learning how to read and write, and they're also learning the boundaries of acceptable computer usage. You know, they're pushing the limits as far as they can. And yeah, they're 14, 15 years old, the hormones are raging, pornography is very, very high on their list. Interesting little tidbit on pornography, um, we receive federal funding, tied to that is a federal law that we have to run an internet filter. If a child, if I know a child is getting to pornography and I don't stop it, I'm a felon. Eight year felony. It's a thin red line that they have to walk. They're hacking, they're busting my systems, they're banging them from the inside with domain user credentials, right? That's the first thing the red team wants to get is they're coming in from the outside. They want to get a regular, unprivileged user account inside the domain and then they want to start escalating. My folks already got that. They're already part way there. They're a third of the way there, right? Local user account, local admin, pop that up to a, to a domain admin. You know, that's usually the progression everybody likes to follow. They're a third of the way there. It's interesting. I need to teach them where the limits are. I need to stop them before they go too far. And when I fail, I've not only failed the organization, I've let my data out, you know, I've got us headlines because there's porn all over the smart board, but I've also failed that child. At that point, if he's gone that far, if he's you know, successfully breached my network, he's going to get expelled. And now that's on his permanent record. Where would we be today if David had gotten popped when he was in high school? He never would have gotten his security clearance when he was in the Marine Corps. We, we don't know what path he would have followed at that point. So when they succeed, I fail them. Not only my organization, but them too. Got to remember, and yeah, that's the baby picture you're looking for. <laughs> They all start out as innocent little babies, right? And they progress through school and into the, you know, the young man that David's become, but they take a stop right here in high school. <clears throat> they're smart, they're inquisitive, they're pushing it. You know, the next David Kennedy is in somebody's high school somewhere. He's in mine, he's in one of your guys's. He's somewhere learning, be banging, he's downloading backtrack, he's bringing it in. So what I did first was I tried to quantify my threats. And I really pay attention to the inside, you know, for all the reasons I've described. I've got the usual outside threats, but I'm not a high value target. Our bank account is a high value target, and we're gonna get into some phishing discussions in a minute here. Um, but inside, they want the tests, they wanna to get to their grades so they can change them, they wanna to get to their attendance so they don't even have to come. You know, and surfing, it's its own threat. Like I mentioned, they're children with hormones, they want to um, get to porn, they wanna to get to music, they wanna download videos, the bandwidth I use is just amazing. And BYOD is its own threat. Three years ago, I came to my first DerbyCon. It was the first DerbyCon. I went to Boris's now infamous, you know, stop clicking on shit talk. And it was actually was one of the best talks I've ever seen. You know, he spent, he had his slides, and in like 10 minutes he was done with his slides. He just like, he was on steroids. He went, he went right through them and he was done. Speaking of that, where am I at here? Well, wow, plenty of time. So after he got off of his slides, he started talking about his philosophy and how you know, we need to get users to stop clicking on things. We all know that's not 100%. It's not going to happen. It's a place to get. You know, it, it's worth the effort, but it's not going to get you there. But the big thing that hit for me was when he you know, stood up and screamed, stop buying stuff. I don't have the money to buy stuff, so that was an easy rule for me to follow. So what can I do with what have I got, with what I've got, what's available to me free from the community, what's available out there? And the other thing that Boris hammered was stick with what you know or you'll mess it up. So I stayed focused on where my training was, on the things I'd used in the past. I stuck with Cisco. I stuck with Microsoft. A few and a few odds and ends that I learned along the way, but I stuck with, stuck with the core items. So what do you do at that point? The biggest thing for me was defining my attack vectors. Where's the attack going to come from? It's going to come from the student machines, for the most part. 
So I need to take a look at what that traffic, all those machines and where they're at and pay particular attention to them. Pay attention to the red team. You know, obviously I'm here to support my son and help him with his con, but a huge part of this for me was learning what the red team's doing, learning what kind of attacks are coming, where they're coming from, how they're escalating their privileges, so I can pay attention to them. And that was the biggest thing, was learning how to attack. And then I'm just a junkie for information on the internet. I mean, I'm, I'm old school, I still belong to a bunch of listservs. Those are email servers for those of you that haven't been around. You know, NT sysadmin, uh, Stu, I, he was supposed to be here, but he's not. He's uh, partnered with Kevin Mitnick now in some security training company. Well, he's been running NT sysadmin for as long as I can remember. Awesome source of information. Look for those kinds of listservs that are, you know, prevalent to the kind of software you use, the kind of OSs you are running, and dig in. I mean, I can ping a gentleman by the name of um, Michael, Michael Smith on that, on that listserv. Now, you go to a bookstore, if you can find one that's still open, his name is on the size of the books for exchange. I mean, he is an exchange MVP. He's one email away. I can get him 24-7 through the weekends and everything. Patchmanagement.org, if you're running a Microsoft system, get on that one. There are some really smart people there. Uh, Susan Bradley, she's just unbelievable. Came in last Wednesday. Did you guys see the new IE zero day that came out last Wednesday? Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, early Wednesday morning? I came in and saw the headline, saw it on the blogs that I look at. I flip over to patchmanagement.org and Susan Bradley's already got the emails with all the tech articles, all the instructions and everything on how to mitigate that zero day. You know, within 15 minutes of me sitting down at my desk, it was done. And blogs and stuff like that. The big thing for me, though, was getting management buy-in. When I started there back in 2001, 2002, I had two major heart attacks the very first day. My students were local admins. <laughs> All right, but it gets better. They weren't just local admins like on their machine. They were local admins on every machine in the district. They were local admins on the treasurer's machine, the superintendent's machine. The, the, the teachers were admins on each other's machines and everybody else's. Everybody was an admin on every machine in the district. You understand in, in, in this environment, you know, the students are very fluid. They're not logging into the same machines every day like, they, like you would in an office environment. I fixed that right away, you know, tagged the student accounts out of the admin account right away. I broke six or eight pieces of software my very first day there, but I wasn't going to let it make it to day two. By the end of the week, everything was fine. But I needed, at that point, I knew I had a fight on my hands. I had needed management, management buy-in. So I signed up for a security audit. Uh, brought in the company that, a company that Dave used to work for. And I spent probably six, eight months getting as clean as I could and came in and let them own me. And they, they didn't do, you know, I didn't do too bad, but they got us. You know, they got domain admin. Well, they never got domain admin, but they got admin rights on every server through a Veritas backup exec patch that I'd missed. And we'll talk about patching real soon. Um, they totally ripped our SQL servers to shreds. I mean, just SQL injection, cross-site cross -site scripting. You know, everything's been around since 1999. And that was like the best thing I ever did because in a school district, everything you do that's related to the business of running the school is a public record. Any one of you can come down to my school district and pop a letter on my desk and say, I'd like to see a copy of your security audit. It then becomes a public relations nightmare for the school. It turned into the only written memo I've ever gotten there in my entire career. You know, real simple. Here's a security audit. Here's the deficiencies. Your charge is to fix it. And they handed it to me in writing. I got that framed in my office. I point to it all the time. <laughs> you got a problem with that? Talk to the memo. <clears throat> And I, and I don't want to sound like a hard ass. I'm not. I'm extremely accommodating for everybody. When I, when I snagged local admin rights from the staff, you know, I put together a lot of things so they could still get to, you know, a teacher in this elementary building is going to want the same piece of software that a teacher in this elementary building is going to want. It's not hard to put up installs with elevated privs so they can just walk to a website, an internal website, and install it. So you can knock down a lot of that really quickly. So we're very reactive in taking care of their needs. Next thing I did was I documented everything I had, and that was fun. You know, running scripts against servers, finding out what's installed in it. Define what you've got. You've got to know what you got, 
before you can fix it, before you can get a handle on it, and before you can make it work. Document the software, PowerShell queries. I'll show the query a little bit later. You can fire a PowerShell query against AD and come back with an inventory software. No time at all. No time at all. Document the traffic. Where is it going? From what boxes to what servers to what resources? And I did all of that with my master plan in the end to get the students on their own VLAN and their own set of servers in their own world. You know, we've got a cash register system where that works throughout the district where the, the students buy their lunch. Nobody needs to touch that server except the cash registers. And the lunch lady is on their desktops when they run the reports at the end of the day. The student traffic doesn't need to be anywhere there. And that's where I was going for. An eye towards segmentation. You've got to build segmentation between your systems. If they don't need to talk to each other, make sure they can't. There's just no reason not to. Find out what it's doing. Again, more of my information gathering. Logs, logs, logs. You know, a lot of people just don't look at logs until something's broke. Until there's an incident to respond to, software that's failed. You know, then they start looking for the little red access in the Windows Server. Audit everything. Success, failure, object access, all of that stuff. Privilege changes. Audit it all. Buy some disks and be done with it. Web filters. We're going to get into web filters in just a second. For me, web filters are a huge source of information, especially the blocks, because I can see what they're trying to do, where they're trying to go, and where they may get away from it sooner or later. And this, Doug Burks, I don't think he's here this year. He was here last year. He gave a speech on Security Onion. Anybody using it? Heard it? Awesome. Doug is the man. All right. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, Security Onion is a free, and that's good in my word, in my world, open source Linux distro that even an MCSE like me can install. I downloaded the distro. I took an old HP server and jammed a bunch of disks in it. And in 30 minutes, I had IDS running on my network. Um, you can run it distributed, so you can have one looking at your uh, egress traffic. You can have another one looking at your server traffic. You can pull the, the, the stuff back together into one management console. Unbelievable. And what is awesome about it is it does full packet capture, and thus all the disks you've got to buy for it. You know, the, the traffic going back and forth to my servers, it pulls every packet down onto the disk and lays it out for you. Snort, bro, you know, Snorby, all of it right there. And you can pivot from one to the next. So I see an alert in Snorby. A couple of clicks later, I'm looking at not just that packet like you see in most IDS is I'm looking at the whole stream associated with that conversation. It's all right there, right there in front of me in, in, in seconds, and you know what's going on. I, mean, I plugged it in. I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. 30 minutes with minimal effort, it was rocking and rolling. And during that time, my network guy was over there getting me a mirrored port in, in the switch. Went back, fired it up, and I had my next stream of heart attacks. <laughs> Our web developer that gave Dave all the cross-site cross, cross uh, site scripting and, um, and SQL injection attacks, had LDAPed our internal porter, portal into our AD in plain text. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you know, it just happens. <laughs> so if I had never come here, never gone to Doug's talk, I don't know that I would have had an IDS that gave me that kind of detailed information, that gave me that heart attack the first day. So those of you that were smart enough to go to Ben's talk last night, you know, he talked about touching your network, learning it inside and out. I was sitting in the back like, God, the dude just stole my, my talk. You know, but it was nice. It was a nice validation. Somebody way smarter than me talking, talking the same language. This is the, the one slide where I got to ask. So last year, the red team baked a cake for 08, 067, and had a party for its fifth birthday, and saying it happy birthday right out here. Why? Why are we still getting popped on 067? Why is that happening? Because we're not doing our patching right. There's no other answer to it. We're not doing our job if we're still getting popped on 067. There is no excuse for it. Uh, took Carlos's class earlier this week, and he mentioned they're seeing, on average, a 90-day window on patching. Patch Tuesday is, you know, it was last week. A lot of orgs, on average, 
aren't getting patched until 90 days from now. Think about that for a second, 90 days. Would you hand them your domain admin account for 90 days? That's pretty close to what you're doing if you're gonna stay that kind of open. So, you gotta build a process to patch, patch religiously and do it all the time. Remember the uh, audit I talked about, my memo and frame on the wall? It's patch Tuesday, talk to the memo, don't talk to me. You know, it, it has to be driven that way. You have to make it part of the environment of your, of, of your um, IT department. Third party patching, we know that's a nightmare. God, Java, and in my environment, everything runs on that stuff. You know, it runs on Java, it runs on Flash, it runs on, I used to use QuickTime on my network. I didn't even, you know, until I got there, I didn't even know it still existed. A couple ways to do it. You can try and keep track of it in a spreadsheet, which is doable. But take a look at Ninite. How many people have heard of Ninite? There we go. Guy, right, that's better. Ben meant to ask that question. There's only like two people in his talk that heard about it. I pay a couple hundred bucks a month for it, and I can patch all my third-party stuff. Just like click, 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 click. Download the installer. Shove it out with a GPO the same day as Patch Tuesday. Ruin their day for them. They'll get over it. Any problems, talk to the memo. And we go. And I'm not, again, I'm not a hard ass. If it's testing week for state testing, no. You know, we skip Patch Tuesday for a few days. But last Tuesday was the worst patch cycle I've seen from Microsoft in years. It was the worst. I was still done by Thursday morning. 35 servers, 3,500 desktops. But are you patched? And I wonder if that isn't why 067 is still so popular with the red team. Are you verifying your patches somewhere besides WSUS? You know, hit your machines and look at them. Are the patches there? Are they installed? Is it working? So here you go. Everybody's always, always, always into sharing code. There's mine. PowerShell, bang against your AD, grab all your computers and get hot, and pipe it into get hot fix. And that'll hit your machines and it'll pull you down a really nice list of all the installed um, updates right there. Pipe it out into a, into a CSV or whatever and you're done. What I do is um, randomly grab computers out of OUs, drop them into a sub OU and then just target that OU. So I'm checking, you know, 10% of my network each Tuesday, each patch Tuesday. All right, so let's talk about the web filter. I've never heard anybody here in the, in the last three years talk at all about web filtering. I want to show you why it's so awesome. Yes, people hate them. In my case, sorry about that, talk to Congress. It's federal law for me to have a web filter, period. End of discussion. I spent six months in online demos, in WebExes, with every web filter company out there because the one we had was just horrid. And then I brought in three of them and put them live in my environment over the summer when the kids aren't around and narrowed it down to the one I wanted. I'm not here to sell this particular web filter. I'm just saying do that kind of research because if you get the right one and can make it dance, it's a powerful, powerful tool. So yeah, you got what you expect. All your categories, right? And up here is porn and, and education and, you know, and, and each one of those little check boxes, you know, you pop out shopping, there's a million different shopping categories and you can drill down into those and block and unblock and, and, and all of that. But the reason I brought this slide is I want to show you this. No web filter is perfect, right? We're over, we're over a billion websites now. It's not going to know all of them. They're not going to all be categorized. So what do I do with an uncategorized site? If my web filter has never heard of it, what do I do? Block it. And if there's a problem... <laughs> But when I do that, when I do that, there's a commitment on my part to my children. If it's a legit website, I'll have it on black for you before lunchtime. Just hit our help desk system, bang the website in there. Don't tell me you're going to come and key my car or give me a hard time. I'm not the guy that blocks anything. I'm the guy that unblocks everything. You got to get it unblocked. If a website they need, and, and there's a lot of really small educational websites that like teachers make for other teachers. You know, and it's, you know, Mrs. Smith in Texas.com. You know, it, it never hears of them. So I do a lot of unblocking. So let's talk about what that does for us. Let's go through the anatomy of a fish. And I mentioned earlier on about... <laughs> no, this one... <laughs> 
You missed the first two. You want to see the first two? All right, Dave just came in. Hang on, bear with me, folks. Oh, you got the don't let me get a nice old picture. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about a fish. Um, Nick, is Nick here? You're Nick? Nope, Nick's not here. All right, Nick works with Dave. You know, Dave's headquartered in Cleveland. Nick gave a talk at a local InfoSec gathering about three, four weeks ago where he showed, you know, how he does a fish, a spear fish. And he uses set. Thanks, Dave. Um, and he goes through a real detailed reconnaissance of the company, you know, and he builds a website stealing all their graphics and everything, you know, mirroring it with set. And he goes out and he buys a domain name. So my domain name is, you know, school.org. He goes out and buys, you know, free software dash schools.org and puts the dash in there to make it look like it's mine. And you, you show that to 100 users, 99 of them are going to just see it as another dot. They're not going to see the dash. They're not going to realize it's a different domain. And they're going to click on it, right? Typical. Is that anybody going to disagree that that isn't pretty much how a spearfish goes? So let's go back. Uncategorized sites. They haven't, my web filter never heard of it. If it has, it's already categorized it as malicious. If it hasn't, it's blocked. Simple as that. You know, I know web filters are extremely unpopular in, in the corporate world. You know, you don't have Congress telling you you have to have one. Um, have HR tell you you have to have one. You know, hey, HR director, we're not blocking porn. How do you feel about that with sexual harassment cases? Go get another department on your side. We do that all the time. You know, as departments, we team up and work together. You know, not nefariously. We work together to the common good, but that's how we do it. So there's a story behind this picture, so let's take a quick break here on the real stuff. <laughs> but the story doesn't go with the, the next slide. It goes with this slide. <laughs> this was Dave's first fishing trip. His, his, his first fishing trip, right? This is Dave's first successful fish. See that? See what I did there? All right. So we went out to a buddy of mine's house who lived on a lake in Michigan. And we were like halfway around this lake with a stupid fishing pole, winging it out there, and we didn't catch jack. Nothing. You know, a couple of hours fishing, dragging this poor guy around. So we're walking back to his house. We decided to give up. And we're walking along the shoreline. And I look over, and there's this dead fish <laughs> laying on the ground on the, on the beach. And so I handed the fishing pole over to my buddy and distracted Dave. And my buddy hooked that dead fish <laughs> on Dave's pole and cast it out in the lake and said, you know, Dave, we got to try right here because this is a good spot. Let's try one more time. And there you go. Dave caught his first fish. <laughs> So Dave's, so Dave's first fish was my best ever social engineering attack. That's not how I remember it. <laughs> That's the best social engineering attack. All right, so let's, let's breeze through some basic things. And, and, and I realize that this is not earth-shattering you know, earth uh, uh, stuff here. This is, but. If you don't make this list and you don't think about it and don't generate your own list and make your list bigger, and this is not my whole list, it just doesn't happen. Let's start with Emmet 4.0. How many of you got it out there on your servers? Oh. All right, all the rest of you that rose your hand for Ninite, go home, download Emmet 4.0, and put it on your servers. It's better. It doesn't patch anything, but it kills everything. Kills everything. Unbelievable. You know, go, go around afterwards and ask some of the red teamers. How many boxes are you popping that are run Emmett? That was a zero. It's that good. And I had no negative effects. You gotta be careful around exchange. You don't want to hook it into your transport. Uh, you gotta watch that. Um, but overall, not a big deal. I mean, it was pretty painless. I, I, I blew it onto my 35 servers with minimal testing in an afternoon. You know, during the summer when there's no kids around. I mean, I, I do have that advantage over all of you. I've got two and a half months where I can like, blow it up. <clears throat> An ASA between your users and servers. And we talked earlier about how we documented our network and we documented how we're going to segment the resources that people need so we can get the students over here with their resources 
and we can keep the finance department over here. Oh, good grief, back up. The young categorized sites and blocking. We were fished. Our treasurer's department was fished. Almost every treasurer's department in the state of Ohio was fished within about 15 seconds of each other. They knew our treasurer's email address. They knew what bank we had. Remember I talked about my audit before being a public record? Who we bank with is public record. It's public knowledge. Our email addresses are public record. You can request all of our email addresses from us, and we have to give them to you. I've done it. Couldn't believe I had to do that. I had to call the lawyer twice, and he's like, sorry, dude. No. <laughs> um, so my phone rings. I pick it up as a treasurer, and you got to understand that the treasurer in, in, in a school district is like the second most senior dude. And um, we got good senior management, good, good people. And he's like, man, your, your filter's getting me again. He goes, we got an update from our bank. I got to install it. We got to transfer money this afternoon for payroll. You know, and it's not like we're broke, you know, it's just the way they flow the money. I'm like, okay, send me the email, I'll get it unblocked for you right away, no problem. And that's always been my charge, with my, my commitment to them. I will unblock it right away. He sends it to me, and it's a fish. Out to an EXE to a keylogger. Couldn't believe it. Out to a website with an EXE to a keylogger. I mean, that's what we're trying to fight against. Real world, it worked. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and I don't want to make him sound stupid because he is not. He's a very smart man. All the people I work with are just incredibly well-educated, good people. They're users. They're no different. You know, doctors are smart people. They get fished all the time, too. Thanks, Dave. Um, so, ASA between your users and servers. I've got two ASAs. I've got one on my perimeter, and I've got one at the top of my server rack, or my, my switch rack for my servers. I segment everything out. Like we talked earlier about the, the cash register system. The cash registers can only talk to the cash register server, and nothing else can talk to it except for those couple of workstations that need to run reports. Nobody else can get to it. Um, we've got lots of stuff like that that you, know, you just can't touch. The students are out on their own. Their own VLAN throughout the entire ser district. Their servers are on their VLAN. That's it. They've got the read-only domain controller. Read-only domain controllers, anybody? Okay, after you get done putting in Emmet, put out read-only domain controllers. Put two more on their own VLAN and leave them there. Nobody else can get to that VLAN except your other domain controllers. Ponder that one and think about what it does for you. All right, so we're controlling that traffic flow with our ASAs and our VLANs. Firewall in 2008. I'm old school. First thing I ever did when I installed an NT server was turn off the firewall, right? I think a lot of people still do that. I really get that feeling. <laughs> Windows firewall, you know, it's, it's not an ASA. You know, it's not awesome, but it's a layer. It's another step in the process, and it's free. Remember, we're still doing this all low budget. Turn it on when you first spin it up. You know, most people, they turn it off, and they enable remote access, you know, remote desktop, and then they put it in the server rack, and they go back to their comfy chair. Hey, I got a new server going. Put it on right at the beginning. It's smart. As you install Exchange, it'll open up port 25 and 110 for you and 443 for your OWA. It watches what you're doing. Nine times out of 10, you still won't have to touch it after you install your software. It's already doing it. Now, here's one that is controversial. I'm not saying it's a rule. You see, I'm bold to consider. Consider taking servers out of the domain. Yeah, there's a downside to that. They're not under your group policies. You're not controlling them that way. But in my case, for example, I've got uh, an HVAC system. Every thermostat in the school district and all 12 of those buildings is controlled by one central server. It's on a management VLAN. There's no reason for it to be in the, it's got no, no path out to the internet. There's no reason for it to be in the domain. Just throw it out there. Encrypt your databases. A lot of SQL servers running around without databases encrypted on them. Yeah, that's an easy one. It's almost a right click and you're done. Patch them. You know, we talked about, we had the whole slide on patching before. You gotta patch them. And you gotta watch your third party stuff. When Dave came in and popped me, he popped me on Veritas Backup Exec. I had an agent on my file servers. It was an older agent. I hadn't updated it. It had a vulnerability. He tagged me on it. You know, and, and he came in and he spun up Backtrack and went after us. 
What's, you know, I gotta, I gotta worry about the kid that's gonna come in and spin up backtrack and go after me. I've gotta cover all those exploits. FSRM, not a lot of Windows admins know about that one. File Server Resource Manager. It's built right into Windows. A lot of guys use it to put out quotas and stuff like that. You can do file blocking with it, and it's awesome. You can block zips, you can block EXEs, DLLs, and it works. And, you know, and none of this you know, changed the file extension from DLL to TXT. It will still stop it. It knows it's a DLL. It's not stupid. Cheap, easy, and free. Local admins, restricted groups. I really believe in restricted groups. I don't trust my desktop technicians to not put other people in there they're not supposed to. Watch restricted groups if you've not used them already. When you've rolled it out the first time, there's two options. You can add to existing local admins, or you can just replace everything that's on there. I always do replace. That wipes out everything something somebody else put on there. But as you're rolling it out, you've got to pay attention that you don't pull out your, your, your SQL dev or whatever. Disable cache credentials, right? Now, obviously, whoops. There's a little bit of a conflict there on that one. I always point this one out because the first time I learned it, I was really happy. All right, you know, you disable cache credentials and your domain controller smoked, you know, what do you do? You know, you, it's time for sneaker net. Go up, F8 it, that will re-enable a local admin account and you're okay. So I just want to toss it out there as my tip for the day. Desktop hardening. This was a big one for me. You know, Dave and Scott White, Scott, are you here? No, he's over at CTF. They came in, we gave them a student account, we gave them a student machine, just like they're a student, and they sat there and hammered on us for two days as students. And there they didn't get me. They did not get in. No admin, period. Again, control of restricted groups, replace, don't add. One of the big things we do, this is huge for us, common images, standardization on the desktop. It lets you keep an eye on the ball if you've only got one ball to look at. If you've got 50 different configurations on the desktop in 14 buildings, you're going to make mistakes. Oh, there's Emmett. Again, no problems. The only issue I've had with Emmett is Chrome and Silverlight on a Microsoft website. Emmett kills Silverlight. So I consider that a bonus. I'm not sure that's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> remote desktop. I've got internal remote desktop servers for some of the people that I have that do what I consider sensitive information. After the great near phishing disaster, anything financial, the financial department logs into remote desktop. That server only goes out to about four or five websites. Remember my filter? Right? That's all it can go to is our bank, our payroll system, and that's about it. Anything like that, they got to hit that remote desktop. They can't get out to it. Local firewalls on, event logging again, auditing success and failure, hide last user log on. I'm going through the simple things here, right? Oop. And here's the big one for us. I nuke everything. Any user opens up a control panel, all they see is add, remove printer. That's all they got. Nothing else. Nuke the task manager. Here's my favorite. I've gotten run, CMD, and Internet Explorer drives all killed. I don't know how many of you, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't even know you can go whack whack server name in IE and open up a file share on the server. You know, and, and that's a separate policy you gotta hit other than not, you know, other than just disallowing regular network browsing. You know, bad files, no VBVS in the user context, that's all banned by a group policy. I'm hiding the C drive, they can't see it, they can't go in there and bang around. I, I, I'm still running IE, and I'm running IE because of IE maintenance. Their zones, their history, all of those settings, I handle it for them. I, I, I control their trusted sites, they can't add any, they can't remove any. You know, they need one, I'll add it for them in a heartbeat. Java, I hate Java, don't we all? <clears throat> I've got an app still running that requires Java 6. You know. And it's our old student information system. And that's, you know, the permanent record we have to go back and, and look at every once in a while. The new one is actually pretty good, and it's on a new, a new version of Java. But the old one is still there in case something didn't get transferred properly. We've got to double check the transfer. We're just going through that process. It'll go away. But I've got a machine in each building, and the only thing it can go to is the old student information system. 
and it's not in the domain. It can't go anywhere else on the internet. It can't go anywhere else on the network. All it can do is go to the old information system. And the secretaries are like, wait, you know, we need to, to get this data into an Excel spreadsheet over to our computer. Doctor the memo, okay? That one I draw the line on. You know, so Eamon Reed, going back to Java. Emmet, go get it installed. It really hits a lot of those exploits that we're seeing over and over and over again with Java. The rest of them are, you know, people like Dave who are popping remote shells back out to the internet. Egress filtering. My folks can only go out 80 and 443. And to do that, you got to get past my filter. I guarantee you Dave's IP address is not in my allowed list. <laughs> <coughs> BYOD. Oh, man. You know, we are, you know, this is one where you guys in the corporate world are, are, are lucky, all right? You mentioned BYOD to an educator and their eyes light up. Wait, free computers? I can bring in, they can all bring in a computer of their own and we won't have to buy anymore? You know, that's more money for teachers. That's more money for chalk, you know, whatever, whatever it is you need. So what we did was, and my boss again, I mentioned again, he's a genius. He got out in front of BYOD. They started talking about it, making a little bit of noise. He says, yo, this is awesome. I'm going to jump on this. I'll be back at you in a couple of months with a plan on how we're going to do it. And he laid out the plan. Figured, we figured it all out on what we're going to do. And then he targeted a school to be the, the, the pilot test school and had a big function at night, invited the parents, told them to bring their laptops and bring their, bring their Androids and everything. He invited the press to come to this thing, all right? Made it a huge deal. And he rolled out his BYOD program. You get on our guest wireless, which is a completely separate network from our regular network, and you get to go out to the internet, pass the filter, and oh, by the way, here's your Google Apps for Education account. Good luck and joy. Take charge of it. And that's pretty, a pretty stringent BYOD program, but if you sit back and let the sales department dictate what they're gonna do, you're gonna be playing catch up and they're gonna beat you. Get out in front of it, embrace it, accept it, Decide what you can do, what you can afford to do, and roll the program and draw the line yourself before they draw the line for you. We did look at publishing apps. It just wasn't going to happen. It's way too much money. We've got a lot of tablets. We rolled 800 Nexus 7s this summer. Do you guys know there's like no way to automate setting up a Nexus 7? It's like, I spent my whole summer. I mean, and the guy in the office next to me is like, yeah. All right. And then we effed it up, and we spent last week going. <laughs> <laughs> so, should have had a bigger pilot. Um, we own all these tablets. We use two programs on them. One called Meraki, for education and for corporate. It's free. It's nice. It's a free remote locator and remote wipe. It's awesome. So we can find them. We can wipe them if they walk away. We use another piece of software, and, and this probably isn't going to apply to anybody here unless you're in the school business, called Tab, Tab Pilot. And it might be one word. Probably is one word. It's really cool. It's a, it's a launcher. It's just a home screen launcher for Android. Password protected, locked down. We publish. They can only get to the apps on the home screen that we publish to them. They can't get to settings. They can't get to the calculator unless we publish the calculator. They can't get to anything. Just the four icons we publish, these are for um, we're rolling these for um, elementary kids. So we're starting with just simple stuff. And when the teacher finds a new app that, that gets approved by academic services, we can push it out with Tab Pilot. We don't have to touch them. No more of this. So it took us a while to get there, but we did it. All right, we're getting near the end here. Where are we at on time? No, oh, we're good. This is going good. All right, leverage your switches. You know, I talked about segmenting and VLANing. Dive into that. You know, the obvious, SSH, only from your management network. All right, I can't afford NAC. Where's Rocky? Rocky is like my mentor. I love the man. And he came in and taught me Cisco's uh, CSA. And it was really great. And I fell in love with it, and he spent like three days with me pouring over the screen and making it dance. And I kid you not, five weeks later, Cisco discontinued it. I mean, I had, it, I had it going. I mean, it was on my network, running, it was rocking. So, you know, NAC. So now Rocky wants me to buy NAC. I'm like, dude, no, I'm not doing that again. 
So let's look at a couple poor man. Remember, we're doing this on the cheap. Sticky Max, right? The bad guy comes in, unplugs your, 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 your desktop, and plugs himself in. It's not going to fly where we're at. We want Sticky Max on all of our ports. The first thing that plugs into it, that's the MAC address that's authorized on that port. Anything else plugs in, you're done. Can you Mac spoof me? Yeah. Kill unused ports. They're dead. Cables pour, pulled in the closet. If a port is not in use, it's dead. It's got to be. You know, and, and again, yeah, the desktop text, this is one they really hate me for. And there's the memo. Yeah. All right? Egress filtering, we hit on that. My servers can't go out on the web on anything other than what they need to. You know, the email server can go out port 25, that's it. Everybody else is filtered down to 80 and 443 in my web filter. There are a few apps that have to go out, and yes, there's exceptions with specific sources and specific destinations. The trick here is, is that it never ends. You know, take your memo on fixing security and hand it back to the management and say, you know, this is great, but this takes time. You know, you can't do it just today and then not worry about it for six more months or a year and have another audit, you know, and, and try and get caught back up again and forget about it a year. I negotiated 20% of my time, all the time, to be dedicated just to security. That's every Wednesday, right? Day after Patch Tuesday. That's why by Thursday I'm done. And my boss walks in, I've got his permission to point to the memo and tell him to talk to the memo. I really do. <laughs> so you gotta keep up with it. You gotta keep up with it. All right. So that's my official talk. This is Dave's first documented hug. <laughs> <laughs> And it's available at the HFC booth in t-shirt form. Just let you know, I'm winning the bid. So at the very least you can do is go run Dave up so he gives more money to HFC. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.